So welcome then to the second part of the second part of our study of white sail. And um, one thing I thought to draw attention to is the fact that we're actually reading scripture that was written in English. You know, most of the Buddhist scriptures that we have, they are translations. And um, there's a lot of really good translations. So um, that's 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 you know that works but we do have an extraordinary situation here that we have a sublime realized vijadara who actually wrote in english where we can you know hear the syllables and words that arose in his wisdom mind so this is to have direct you could say untranslated scripture is extraordinary rimpuja wrote himself in english he he um like I'm often saying, he sort of developed his own particular uh, English, which is very poetic. So, um, so that's something that we should appreciate in the course of this study. All right. So just to go through the opening uh, homage, and uh, while briefly lent this precious human body's white sail, pushed by clear intentions, gentle wind, without turning back towards miserable samsaric deserts, and making the error of missing this chance, try to receive virtue's jewels by crossing the waves of ocean mind to the serene continent of the triple gems, since doing this is more meaningful than anything else. So this chapter is quite long, and actually the last chapter in the book, I think it's called Kaya's and Wisdoms, but it's uh, even longer, so that will be divided into three parts. So remember, just starts off with this um, quote. For those of you who want to attain enlightenment, do not study many teachings, only study one. What is it? It is great compassion. Whoever has great compassion has all Buddha's quality in their hand. So this is something that speaks to us in terms of the... We're talking about love and faith, which we could sometimes refer to as um, emotions, but they're a bit more than emotions in the usual self-centered um, context. This is much more about magnanimity of mind, greatness and courage and so forth. So it's that kind of vastness, but it's very pervaded by this warmth, and this warmth is not centered on any self. So within this great compassion, we have both wisdom and compassion. So that single quality of great compassion is the very nature of the Buddha's wisdom. So emotions are helpful but not essential to practice. Whether we have emotions or not, we carry on. So the point is we shouldn't think that if we don't have emotions, as we know that emotions are very much the um, stuff of the path, dealing with emotions and transforming them and so forth. But then again, we shouldn't cultivate them. In case we're sitting there and we're just calm, that's okay. We shouldn't cultivate them if they're absent. Emotions, they re reflect circumstances. And as such, they're unpredictable. So we should practice regardless of whatever is arising in our mind. There should never, we should never have that thought that uh, our practice requires something. If emotions are absent or present, it doesn't change how we practice. We just keep on practicing until we arrive at the what Rinpoche refers to as the, the non-practice of enlightenment. However, emotions are wasted unless we can use them for practice. So this is a quote from Rinpoche. However, when practicing, Nothing is wasted. We practice with commitment, faith, and devotion. Unconditional Buddha is discovered within. So when Rinpoche says emotions are wasted unless we use them for practice, the point is that whenever we are uh, practicing, uh, nothing is, waste, is wasted. Um, so 
with the practice of meditation, with the practice of mindfulness, with the practice of integrating in our practice in post meditation, there's nothing that is is wasted. However, if we have emotions and we're not embracing them by by practice, then they are of course um, they're waste. They're waste. The potential of emotions is wasted. So practicing then. We are planting the seed of enlightened phenomena. All the phenomena, including emotions, they're embraced by wider perspective. We engage with commitment, applying our samaya or commitment to the path, our faith and devotion, and we attempt and aspire and effectively through practice merge our mind with the Buddha. And doing so, the the grip that ordinary conditional phenomena holds on us dissipates and through that we unveil unconditioned confidence and unconditioned phenomena so this is more than just ignoring uh, phenomena ignoring emotions or having an antagonistic attitude that we don't want something rather through the practice of meditation the stainless mind free from conditional constructs is discovered as our own personal experience. So that unconditional quality is, you could say, the the absolute aspect, ultimate aspect. In relative truth, however, we pray and we offer make offerings to the Buddha. But then in the ultimate context, the Buddha and ourselves are inseparable. Emotions have the nature wisdom. Such wisdom is unveiled with the intelligence, prajna, of study and meditation. Now, it doesn't mean that emotions are wisdom for yogis who have realized that nature they dawn as wisdom, but we're just talking about their essence or their nature is wisdom. So presently we might humbly acknowledge that we might not entirely be have realized the essence of the nature of the emotions. And in terms of the path, to arrive at that realization, this wisdom, we apply then the proactive measures of unveiling the insight or prajna through the paths of hearing and critical thinking, which is study, and then the practice of meditation. Now, negative emotions, they can be used for practice. And they're not a problem when they're transformed. And according to the higher Mahayana, the nature of emotions or passions is wisdom. And the emotions reflect how wisdom is present within our mind and is inseparable from Buddha nature. When we wake up the sluggish mind through study or practice, we uncover wisdom through that intelligence through that insight prajna kabjadigu kanzaramaji he says study and reflection will cut through your more gross misconceptions but the subtler ones can only be dispelled by meditation and by integration of the absolute wisdom that arises from it into your very being when such wisdom is joined so that's end of quote from dugu kanzar and the point being that when such wisdom is joined with faith in sublime beings, wisdom blossoms further. And this is very much what this chapter is about. We're very much talking about the quality of the warmth, but particularly that that um, devotion, that nature of faith that brings our path beyond just, you could say, the rational cause and effect of the causal vehicle, of the general Buddhist vehicle, and enables us to see the unconditional wisdom, which is then the foundation of the Vajrayana path, that requires this, um, this devotion. And hence, when we apply prajna that we gain through the general path, and together with faith and devotion for sublime beings, then wisdom blossoms further. And here the great Ransom Pandita, Rinpoche refers to him as, I think, Dharma Bhadra, or excellent Dharma. I forget exactly what Rinpoche uses. But, um, but anyway, um, when that is joined then, 
um, this the prajna together with the um, with the devotion. Then there's a quote. Then um, the sky has no obvious appearance, but it pervades everywhere. And so in that way, when we have this um, unity of prajna and devotion, then there's no limit in terms of all our perceptions, all our appearances, and so on, all phenomena. They all arise as as the expression of the single wisdom. And that's that will, will be reflected in the discussion that follows now. Experience, like faith, enable us to go beyond samsaric phenomena. While the path accommodates such experience, ultimately, enlightenment is beyond attachment and experience. So, tem temporarily, according to our nature, our disposition, where we um, have relative phenomena, obviously, dualism, something like faith enables us to, is you can say, faith is something that is experience of phenomena, but it's something that melts away this dualistic grasping. Beginners, they're very often concerned with spiritual experiences. And so we beginners, we might have moments of faith and devotion and be delighted about that. And this is indeed something that's great. And also just generally eliminating our, our confusion and our pain and so forth increases great faith in the path. Yet experiences remain objects of the grasping mind. And this grasping mind then it solidifies these perceptions as substantial as solid. However, in reality, any experience is merely circumstantial based on the grasping habits where we objectify, and they come from and create attachment. The path integrates such attachment as it does in terms of devotion and so on, experiences of the path, and hence it uses skillfully these attachments or phenomena of the path uh, until finally then we are released into the natural abiding reality of enlightenment that is beyond all experiences, that is beyond conditioning. So faith in Buddha, in Buddha nature, must come from within. Three reasons given in Uttara Tantra with regards to the, you could say, the reality or nature of this Buddha nature. Buddha nature, it pervades, is present within all sentient beings. It's equally present in all, meaning also Buddhas and sentient beings. It is the lineage and truly abiding reality of all sentient beings. So all sentient beings are innately Buddhas in reality. Now, when we are, when we speak about devotion and faith, we're talking about a quality within ourselves, which is, you could say, a recognition of a dimension that is subtle. It's this unreserved condition of being deeply touched by the teacher. And within that, or finding that, what we could, what Rimshu refers to as the basis of faith um, within ourselves. Um, then we have the, the the basis for the path, but there's no linear standard procedure for arriving at this point. It's something that we all have, and everybody would have a difference. Some are deeply touched by the fact that their teacher is kind, or some others would that the teacher is very sharp, or whatever. But there's a non-conceptual quality of appreciation and, and being deeply touched that we can refer to as blessing. And that becomes the basis of the Vajrayana path. This basis is not just trusting in someone or liking somebody, but it's really the foundation of the whole um, connecting with the path, which we then refer to as faith. So in some sense, this is the highest recognition then of the common ground of enlightenment of our Buddha nature. Yet as the Buddha, as the, this manifests um, 
as the way that this manifests in different people uh, is so uh, infinite. There are so many different ways that um, these qualities are manifest, and there's also many ways in which um, beings have, or you could say, connect with that. In many ways in which persons have faith. But there's one thing that's that's very important to understand about this ground nature, which is it's something that's shared by Buddhas and sentient beings. And so the Uttara Tantra, which is um, the work which it's um, the wor the words of Maitreya written down by um, the great sage Asanga, and this work highlights the nature um, of um, this Sugata Gaba or Buddha nature. And so there are some perspectives on this. First of all, that all sentient beings, they have it. So we're not looking for something that's apart from the mind that we already possess. So this is also where we have the quote from, I think, the third Kamapa that says, you know, enlightenment is not attained through spiritual um, uh, fabrications. Two, this Buddha nature exists equally in all, in all Buddhas and all sentient beings. It's not as if mm, Buddhas have have more of it and sentient beings have less. It's uncorrupted in samsara and unchanged in nirvana. All sentient beings have enlightenment as their natural heritage. They are natural lineage holders of the essence of the Buddha. This Buddha nature is their true nature. So in the Mahayana in general, we think of this as something that is our heritage. And in Vajrayana, there's more the recognition of this as being our true nature. And that's where we then refer to Buddha nature as deity. And this is the abiding reality of all sentient beings. So when we are, for example, instructed to see others as Buddhas, it's not just that we are kind of trying to pretend that others and ourselves are something that we're not, it's actually acknowledging what truly is there and seeing through the artifice and the confused projections of our ordinary perceptions. The quality of Buddha nature are concealed, yet they are still spontaneously present as the abiding reality of the mind, as we were just discussing. When recognized, sentient beings become Buddhas. This puts an end to their delusion. So one might say, if all sentient beings have Buddha nature, why are these enlightened qualities not apparent? And this is because sentient beings' ignorance and obscuration that again stems from lack of connection, lack of faith, um, uh, obscures this nature. And hence, they they don't possess faith or connection with or trust in the common ground uh, that connects our being and the sub sublime beings. So in that sense, we presently see ourselves from very differently from, say, Buddhas or great beings. Whereas if the great beings look at us, they would probably see us as not in, in any way inferior to them or uh, lacking anything, and but at the same time also having what we call the two wisdoms, knowing reality as it is, but also knowing how it appears to sentient beings, they would also understand that we temporarily have this fixation, this confusion. So even though we naturally possess perfection, we ourselves are not aware of it. Whereas the Buddhas, they are actually aware of our um, our perfection and the fact that we are exactly the same as sublime beings. So in that way, we want to understand here when we're using the word faith, it's much more than a belief or a trust. And it goes much further in terms of opening our mind beyond this ordinary rationality uh, of our logical, rigid uh, thinking. Rather, such faith is imbued with this warmth and, uh, you could say, the heart and lucidity of mind, this blessing that melts away conceptual rigidity. And this is then what penetrates the depth of our obscurations and blockages and so on, and enables us to 
proceed on the path. So the qualities of wisdom are always naturally present, they're spontaneously present, we say, because these manifestations of reality are not in themselves obscured. So you could say the, the qualities of enlightenment, they are never diminished or in any way. But we don't see them. So they're there, but we are blind to them. So just like we have the a statue in a mold, all the qualities are there. that We're just not seeing them. All the details and perfection of the statue is there, but we're not seeing it due to the, the, um, the, the statue itself being within the, um, the mold. So, in the innate pure awareness of sentient beings, these qualities are present within the Buddha nature. So, right, what we have right now, in the case of our sentient beings, is that we are twisting or misconstruing reality as solid and, um, you could say, obstructed substance. The substance habit that's been talked about earlier. So, such the power of this wisdom is temporarily limited. Jamgun Mipa Rinpoche, um, he describes this situation of concealment as when a sharp sword is sheathed, when it's in its sheath, or a mirror is hidden. When taken out of concealment, their power and qualities become apparent. So Rinpoche he says, when Buddha nature is recognized and used, sentient beings become the same as Buddha. Meditation allows our wisdom to be reflected in the ordinary mind. So awareness of Buddha nature that inspires faith happens through practice. And that practice could be blessed by recollection of the teacher, being touched by the presence of the teacher as we do in Guru Yoga, visualizing the teacher. And having that immediacy of the, the teacher, um, we have what we could call a direct and even arguably empirical experience of mind's potential. We might not think of this as realization of co-emergent wisdom, but we, we would think of the teacher, the Dalai Lama or our root guru or whatever, and we're transformed. In our ordinary mind, there's a whole different quality that emerges. And this is not uh, something that is a speculation. That's perceived. So there's causes and conditions, us thinking of the teacher, then this changing of our quality of our mind. So we could call this empirical. It's something that we directly experience. It's obviously within the realm of the subjective, but nevertheless, it's real. So you could say the science of Buddhism operates with this subjective dimension of empiricism. So the point is that this is not belief. This is um, experience. So even though ordinary mind is obscured, then through the practice of meditation, like just described or whatever it might be, we connected this mind, this ordinary mind, with wisdom. So Tulin Oberim just says, even though the mind remains temporarily obscured through dualistic habit and intangible, stainless, totally um, transparent, unobstructed awareness is not known completely, there is still a connection between the meditation of the ordinary mind of practice and the pure awareness of great emptiness, which, like water, reflects the sky. So hence, wisdom can be reflected or experienced within an ordinary mind. As a Vajrayana practitioner, one commits to respecting all sentient beings as innately pure and enlightened. Five skandhas are primordially the five families. So when we say the five skandhas, we talk about what constitutes our general, general experience of our individual identity. Um, and in terms of both our body and our mind, all we experience. And we generally to speak about that in terms of five skandhas. But when obscurations fall away, then this sense of identity in our experience, which is normally caught up with the sense of my phenomena, 
are seen for what they truly are, perceptions that are not limited and filtered and censored and diminished and twisted, <laughs> distorted by our delusion, then these, the qualities of the mind arises as the, uh, what we call the ornament of the five Tathagata families. So that's where we then um, we recognize that when we begin the practice, we have the view, which is the abiding of reality of our mind is the Buddha, and that our five aggregates are intrinsically pure as these five Tathagata families. So then that is the view. So as a Vajrayana practitioner, one commits then, as part of the path, to integrating that view, and one is then committed, one commits to respecting the nature of everyone's individual psychosomatic constituents, these skandhas, as innately pure and enlightened. This means everyone, even though we even those we dislike or fear, and on the topic of the world, the events in the world today, there seems to be a lot of fear emerging. This is actually the time where Vajrayana practitioners should actually realize that this idea of liking or disliking others, um, that is something that we actually distorts our proper our perception of others, and we need to work with that. If we're practicing the path, we need to eliminate our delusion. In fact, when we have these likes or dislikes, and likes or dislikes equally, they remind us of what we're doing with the path, which is to eliminate this narrow mind and unveil minds accurate insight into actual reality. So this is where we're not obliged to keep subscribing to this narrative of our habitual predictions that fool us. So we don't we don't need to talk much about it. We don't need to say I must, you know, I really have all these attachments, I really have all these dislikes. It's not really that we need to discuss it. We just need to practice. So we don't need to speak about it with anyone. We just need to actually sit. We need to meditate. We need to practice. So these five skandhas they are essentially deluded perceptions of innate enlightenment, wisdom, wealth, of qualities, the five families. These are spontaneously present as intrinsic to enlightenment. And when we awake as the targetas, then there's no skandhas to be found. And all the trouble we associate with the five skandhas, which is then the nature of samsara, where we go through birth, and death, coming, going, and so forth, this is something that's entirely absent. What's like when we wake up from the dream? This is absent in enlightenment. Accomplishment of deity is accomplishment of wisdom free from duality. The triumphant deity of actual reality defeats delusion through realization of non-duality. With realization, all perceptions are pure as wisdom deity. So, when we speak about accomplishment of deity, this is the realization, the recognition or, and um, full realization of intrinsic awareness wisdom. And at that point, all perceptions, both in terms of ourselves and our phenomena, subject and object, they're all seen without confusion and seen in their intrinsic purity. And here the skandhas are naturally liberated. There's no trace of the dualistic insecurity of someone that dies or someone that is born. Deity originates as the actual reality of unconfused limitless space. Nothing can influence this nature, so it's unconditionally triumphant as a wisdom hero. It defeats the delusion of dualism with a weapon of realization. So if there's someone that needs to, how do you say, win or, mm, yeah, be triumphant, um, this is it. This nature, everything else is just going to be conditions that come and go. So we're talking about this unconditional quality of the the um, triumphant deity. Whatever appears within this ground 
reflects this peaceful and wrathful hero, hero in all aspects of form, sound, and awareness. So such is the nature of the pure perception of wisdom deity. And this is then where, when we talk about peaceful, wrathful, and all the various forms, this simply means all the various um, aspects of enlightenment as we have it embodied in the countless deities, particularly then in, in uh, Mantra Vajrayana, we have countless, countless, countless um, deities, countless mandavas. Actual reality manifests in countless ways for sentient beings with their countless dispositions. Without faith, we're lost. With faith, we recognize Dhammakaya deity. So when we have all these manifestations, uh, such as the Buddha, um, Padmasambhava, Yeshitsogyal, Vajrayogini, Saraswati, Vajrakilaya, Manjushri, and so on, Avalokiteshvara, manifest to sentient beings as we perceive them. In various ways, we we might think of them in terms of historical persons like Manjushri, or we might just perceive them as, as a universal quality, but we see them in terms of something that is embodied, something that also comes with sound and awareness. So this includes statues, tangas, shrines, texts, and also the perceptions that arise out of uh, wisdom, vision, not the distorted hallucinations that we would have on the basis of karma, but on the pure manifestation that arises based on wisdom. So such manifestation of actual reality, deity, what is known the deity of Dhammata, it might also it may also manifest to accommodate the needs of sentient beings, such as according to the five elements, earth where they might manifest as shelter, water as drink, fire as warmth, wind as cool, and cavities and, you could say, space as the quality of the sky. So we say that the pure uh, nature of actual reality deity manifests in countless ways. And such deity is indestructible, inexhaustible, unconditioned. Yet, without faith, without that quality of recognizing faith, and here again, must reiterate, it's not about, the, some, in some theistic traditions, we would consolidate faith on the, on the basis of saying the deity is sublime and I'm, I'm, I'm the opposite of sublime. I'm how do you say, um, inferior. And very often then, the degree to which we, we stress our own inferiority, that's seen as an expression of faith. And that's not what is meant here. Here, faith is what is where we actually have some sense of connecting with um, this nature and discover our own purity, our own ultimate worth. But it has to be done. And it's, it's, it's a genuine experience that only can come about then through the practice, the practice of the path and particularly devotion and so on. So not having that, then we're lacking that dimension. We lack the, you could say, the confidence in ourselves. Yet when we have that faith, then this deity of Dharmakaya is recognized. Rimaji says, no, he doesn't say that, but I just wanted to say that comment here from my side. Um, um, so when we have faith that takes us beyond uh, duality, sorry, without the faith that takes us beyond duality, when we don't have that, then we might objectify enlightenment. But while the path actually accommodates such duality, thinking teacher is great and, and I'm here and uh, I don't have the teacher's qualities, um, we nevertheless accommodate that 
and we do take on to the path a sense of me and sense of very often we would in, for example practice of guru yoga we'd visualize ourselves as a pure deity and invoking the teacher then there is some sense of our own worth and so we could objectify enlightenment as practice of the path thinking of um, sublime beings out there holy objects out there but the objective of the path is to ultimately enable us to discover this non-dual natural primordial purity of co-emergent deity so as much as we have a whole culture of making offerings and so forth this ultimately is about what enables us or creates the condition the atmosphere where we can discover this within ourselves so until attainment of enlightenment wisdom needs to be cultivated cultivating ungraspable non-dual wisdom it expands and purifies all dualistic phenomena so until enlightenment wisdom needs to be cultivated or, or unveiled on the basis of circumstances such as teachers teachings and then our ordinary mind um, using that where we as the as the basis of our practice of the path we eventually then uh, can abide in wisdom with faith in teachings such as the great perfection so chen we can recognize the sublime nature of wisdom within our ordinary mind and how as Rinpoche describes and as Rinpoche just describes it the undiluted basis of all phenomena is the stainless inseparability of space and appearance meaning the nature of all of reality is that appearances appear yet they cannot be grasped their nature is emptiness their nature is like space so while wisdom is without anything that can be grasped it can be described in terms of stainless non-dual awareness and we practice with that applying faith meditation and so forth which enable us then to change our previous habit and increase this non-dual awareness and that's why we then practice have practices such as accumulation of merit prayers sadhana and mantra so when practice is embraced by wisdom even residual confusion might ignite um, wisdom so once we practice then even the manifestations that might um, arise in our mind uh, karma and so forth uh, when it's when our um, practice has some quality of wisdom then there is the possibility that these arisings they themselves might ignite further wisdom so this can then consume impure phenomena till wisdom is less, less left fully manifest this we have in the four dharmas of gambopa where we supplicate saying may confusion dawn as wisdom so just check if there are any questions there's a question here then so perception of wisdom deity may vary for example um, solely sound or solely perceived form yes or combo of all all depending on each person's karma I guess I can just say yes it is a combo um, of all um, when we speak of a wisdom deity in terms of sadhana practice however then when we are you could say mm, you can see wisdom deity manifests in infinite ways in general whether we're practicing or not but of course when we have less obscuration it's more likely to manifest so so yes that's where it manifests according to everyone's individual perception but when we practice sadhana and wisdom deity as a path then then we you could say con consciously uh, apply all three aspects of deity in terms of form as well as mantra and wisdom so that's where we would speak of wisdom deity in terms of um, form sound and and um, awareness but that's in terms of you could say the practice of the path yes so so um so generally this quality and we could call it wisdom deity we could call it buddha nature we could call the blessings of the buddhas and so forth but it will it can man it manifests ceaselessly in fact it's 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 
everything is that. It's just temporarily, it's obscured uh, for us. And then again, every once in a while, there's, there's a crack where the light gets in, and there's um, continually the presence of enlightened uh, wisdom deity in, in all the various, in, continually at the basis of our um, reality. Okay. Wisdom purifies the heaviness of habitual patterns. So cultivated wisdom is, is extraordinary and it's pure compared to ordinary cultivated phenomena. So when we break through to some sense of unconditional wisdom, it's not conditional in the same way, it's not heavy, it's not created by confusion. Confusion is, is eliminated through cultivating practice. And this applies right from the moment that we sit down and do meditation practice to lighting a butter lamp or just extending ourselves in terms of generosity and so forth. And through that then the lightness of wisdom dawns. And even the subtle conceptions diminish. And with that, the habitual patterns are purified. They have less and less anywhere to settle. So in the purity of wisdom, conceptions basic to habit cannot settle. Just like the sky, we can't paint it. We can't, it doesn't hold paint. So this wisdom mind is free from circumstances and is inseparable from the enlightened mind of the Buddhas. This is what we're touching on the moment we do practice. When we practice, blessings should not be dispersed through talking with ordinary persons about practice. So the blessing of the, this kind of awareness that's cultivated through the path comes from faith and devotion. The blessings of Dharma never decreases. It's always, you could say, present within us. But with, um, it is at the same time also something that we are blind to. And through practice, we then recognize and um, recognize um, this ground nature through uh, blessing, through devotion and blessings. But, and we would possibly discuss practice with a teacher, and that could be helpful. It definitely is helpful with speaking with a, a, a genuine great teacher. However, just talking about these things as experiences, that actually creates a kind of materialist and judgmental um, um, sort of view on what's happening in the sense that we we objectify our experiences. They're no longer light wisdom phenomena. They become part of our um, narrative. They become part of us defining who we are and so forth. And then we're just collecting further credentials and developing further narratives. And this then could very well be obstacles. We're consolidating duality, we're consolidating ego, and so forth. So, so practice is to cultivate simple wisdom energy, and it shouldn't be scattered. A kind of simplicity, selfless simplicity. Faith in the teacher can ignite the fire of wisdom. True love and faith come from having faith in wisdom teachers. So connecting with the teacher is essential to introducing the wisdom. Um, this wisdom is like the sun. It illuminates. The moment that we think of the teacher, then our perceptions of ourselves, our phenomena and so forth, they change. So the sun of enlightenment might always be there, but we normally are sort of caught up in all sorts of um, mental games and, and storylines and so forth. And within that, no real presence of faith and devotion. And so we need the, um, the presence of the teacher, which is a bit like what we call the magnifying glass um, of devotion, through which then the wisdom blessing of the teacher can uh, ignite the dry straw of our ignorance. So true, true love and faith come from associating with and having faith in wisdom teachers 
who show the path to enlightenment. And when we say show the path to enlightenment, it's not just that the teacher sort of says, okay, you got to sit and do this and that. The teacher embodies enlightenment. So we're seeing what enlightenment looks like right here, right now. And that sense, we're seeing or being shown the path to enlightenment. Even the fact that the teacher might, for example, be um, uh, courteous or elegant or outrageous or, you know, exceptionally unconventional or free or whatever, all of it is a message that uh, shows us the path. A famous master called Jigun Kyopa, Jigun Sumgun, he said, if the sun of your devotion does not shine, on the Lama's form, the mountain body of the four Kayas. The flowing water of blessing will not fall, so therefore you must persist with earnest devotion. So the wisdom teacher teaches according to the individual disposition of the students. Wisdom teachers should not be thought of, sorry, wisdom teachers should not be thought of as ordinary. And should not be abandoned. They are with us until enlightenment. So teachers need to teach students according to their potential. So we have Rinzen Jigme Lingpa, who would say, in relative truth, wisdom teachers, they accord with traditions and our conventions. While in absolute truth, they contradict our traditions and conventions. So the Relative truth, the teacher is sort of here according to the way that we operate, but ultimately the the absolute dimension is completely unencumbered by any, you could say, of our traditions or conventions. So according to the Buddha, the best, most compassionate teachers adapt to the student's particular situation. The essence of the teaching is the same, and the instructions of the teacher enable the individual to access. So the teacher will adapt according to this to the situation. So that means obviously Buddhism in the many different cultures it's gone, it's adapted to these particular cultures and according to the language of these places. However, what has been communicated, the essence of the teaching is the same everywhere. And there, the language and the ways and the skillful, you could say, application of the teacher has enabled then the students to uh, identify this nature of enlightenment. And that's universal. Wisdom teachers should not be abandoned. They should not be thought of as ordinary. They're inseparable from all Buddhas, and they are with us until enlightenment. So we might think of them as just here in this life, but in fact, there's something that connects with something deep within ourselves and remain uh, with us for the entire duration of our journey until enlightenment. Recognizing the teacher's qualities, we merge with the teacher as inseparable from deity through the practice of sadhana. So this is where then we have the Vajrayana practice of sadhana that is, you could say, um, premised on the um, practice of devotion and invoking the Guru's um, blessings that enable us to recognize the qualities in the teacher and also then merging with these qualities of the teacher through the practice of sadhana. We could say the teacher unites all wisdom deities. We should remember the teacher's qualities, and when we fall short of these, we should recognize the nature of our conceptions. So we should actually have some sense of a profound respect for the teachers and the teacher's qualities, and actually emulate the teacher, and have some sense of the teacher and the teacher's qualities as innate to us. And then when our ordinary habitual body, speech, and mind falls short, then we should recognize that and, you could say, um, settle back into the uh, nature of the wisdom deity as inseparable from the teacher within ourselves. And that's what we do with sadhana. So we can consider deity as the flawless qualities that manifest as, like I was just saying before, um, form, sound, and awareness. So that's when we're practicing sadhana.
So we practice with such a realization, recognizing deity is inseparable from the form, sound, and awareness of the teacher, what we actually call the body, speech, and mind of the teacher. Our ordinary body, speech, and mind is then, then becomes a vehicle for the enlightened body, speech, and mind of the teacher as inseparable from the deity. And we practice with such a recognition according to then our particular disposition and our Buddha nature um, and what we actually call lineage also which is where we are where we recognize this DNA that we have our innate nature as inseparable with the teacher with the deity and also we can take this lineage to meaning all the masters um, prior to our teacher. There's a whole sense of, you could say, a culture or a lineage or a heritage, um, noble family of this manifest quality of enlightenment. And that's where we merge with the deity and the teacher as inseparable from this lineage, which is our lineage. Our lineage in the sense of our Buddha nature. So. Yeah. We're not talking about lineage here in terms of I'm a Kaju, I'm a Nyingma, I'm Longchen Nyingtik, I'm Changte or whatever. Of course, that could could apply, but we're thinking a bit more than that. It's really about our our nature, which is inseparable from from um, our teacher in the form of deity. So, <clears throat> Samaya practice, which Samaya literally means um, sacred commitment. It is to maintain pure commitment with the teacher. If breakage, breakage happens, if we, our commitment is weakened, we purify immediately. So some people confuse themselves. Yeah, they go from teacher to teacher. But actually in the practice of Buddhism, strictly speaking, we never abandon what we have taken refuge in. So there's a sense of the, um, the absolute nature of the teacher. In the Vajrayana context in particular, this commitment is called Samaya. So if we in any way are reserved or hold back or resist what the teacher says or does, we need to look inside ourselves and purify it so no stain or seed is left. So we're kind of falling short of what the teacher is proposing us to do. We need to recognize that and we just need to get rid of that uh, insufficient application, that insufficient commitment. So, you cannot externalize or objectify the Dharma. Gathering information without personal practice and experience misses the point. Only looking for substance, the intangible nature of Dharma is missed. Excuse me, I'm sitting here in, it's dusk and it's getting a bit dark. I'm just going to have to switch on the light. Excuse me. So, <clears throat> as far as the Dharma goes, it's not something we can divorce from wisdom. You can't, we can't really study uh, merely Buddhist theory and then expect to understand what Buddhism is about. We can't understand Buddhism without having developed wisdom. So some people make the mistake of thinking that Buddhism is something that can be isolated and objectified as a theoretical system. And that happens a lot. Now, when that doesn't work for them, they get disappointed and leave it. So not only, and we're not just talking about the, you could say, Buddhism as an acad academic subject, but also some practitioners who want to sort of understand everything and the philosophy, and they just look at it, look at it, look at it, and <laughs> I think that's, that's it, that was Buddhism, and they leave it. So obviously we need to um, make an experience of it. Otherwise, it's like we're just reading the menu and we're never tasting the dish. We're reading about various aspects of human experience, just sitting in an armchair. So, of course, this can be due to exclusively being concerned about this life. Like, we don't want to 
um, set time aside for meditation practice or pursuing the path. So that's just a sort of a superficial commitment there. But however, this kind of externalized relationship and accumulation of information, this kind of learning is easily forgotten and it never touches or awakens the objective of the path, which is the original pure wisdom awareness. Faith requires that we apply ourselves. We need to prioritize what has meaning. To have faith, we need effort and complete dedication. Ordinary projects inevitably always lead to suffering, complications, and they're ultimately futile. So we need to identify what is truly meaningful. The mind is malleable. It, it's something we can work with. So whatever we do with our mind has an impact. So we need to direct it towards bringing ourselves and others towards enlightenment. With impure perception, we miss the nature of Dharma and the path. Unfortunate persons cling to their impure perceptions and waste precious opportunities. Trilinova Ramaja says, whatever is beyond worldly phenomena cannot be understood by worldly reasoning. So faith is linked to, um, or rather lack, or oh, sort of, sorry, this is uh, impure perception. <laughs> uh, impure perception is, um, mm, is what hinders us in seeing qualities in ourselves and in others. Even we meet sublime persons, we won't be able to appreciate them. Even we're involved with Dharma and Buddhist practitioners, we cannot appreciate them as we do not have the experience of the inexpressible meaning of Dharma. Sustaining our impure perceptions, we don't see the qualities others have. We judge those who are sublime and our obscurations increase. Whatever is beyond the ordinary cannot be understood by ordinary reasoning. So again, it's not that we can objectify the study of Dharma as just ordinary rational information. So that be as it may, those who don't realize that, they remain fixated on their impure judgment and even the best circumstances, such as meeting sublime teachers, does not release them from impure perceptions. Instead of using their intelligence to enhance their qualities, they project their own shortcomings onto others, cling to these attitudes and waste the precious opportunity to unite with their own innate heritage of enlightenment's vast wisdom qualities. I was recently reading an academic assessment of some of the great teachers in Tibet, and the language that was used was entirely as if these were politicians. The language that was used was about, or the, sort of the, the analysis was all about the power structures and um, the sort of the uh, agenda of these masters, uh, as if they were, um, you know, trying to establish um, domains of influence and political. Um, power and influence and that's very often where where that's the beginning and the end of some of the discussions around sublime beings which is really sad so it requires that we have the example of the practitioners of the path and the teachings to actually enable us to see through the limited scope uh, of some of these ways of representing um, the Dharma to perceive the qualities of sublime beings requires awareness that brings faith. Such energy releases us from negative influences of impure perceptions. So to perceive the qualities of sublime beings requires awareness. This can happen through proactively eliminating rigid conceptuality through the practice of meditation, through the practice of the path, and then faith happens naturally. The influences and chaos of impure perception is purified with the calm of natural wisdom mind. Wisdom teachers engage in, engage in ways to open the student's mind. With the fortune of pure perception, the teacher can benefit the student limitlessly. 
So wisdom teachers will do whatever is required to open our mind. They might disagree with us and criticize us with the wisdom of discernment, or they might agree with us with the wisdom of equanimity. We cannot judge sublime teachers with dualistic mind. Practically speaking, you might have the teacher who is just immensely fussy about perhaps not cleaning our dishes or perhaps about our personal hygiene, making a big fuss out of that because that has something to do with our obscurations and enables us to move beyond a particular habitual pattern. Or we might be completely off the mark and impossible and impossible as students and yet the teacher just sort of is pretty easy going about it and doesn't really worry. So we can have these various ways in which teachers uh, act. Now we cannot judge sublime teachers with dualistic mind. Whatever a wisdom teacher says is immensely significant and important for our students to recognize, but there's no absolute value being promoted. We could say that there's no reality in it in, in a rigid, absolute, monolithic sense. And whatever the teacher says is more about the particular individual student that this is being said to, or students it's being spoken to. With the right fortune, the student appreciates the teacher's qualities, and that enables the teacher to introduce the student to the student's own true nature and to guide the student onto enlightenment. The value of the teaching is dependent on the practitioner. To an open mind of wisdom, the teacher and teaching can be seen in all phenomena. So the profundity of any teaching is not contingent on the subject matter of the teaching, but on the, the, subje the subject, the subjectivity, the individual that engages with this teaching. The mind that um, is about to be uh, processed and which needs to open to wisdom. All phenomena can be seen as teaching and all phenomena can be seen as part of actual reality by someone who has such an open um, open wisdom mind or is cultivating it. Hence, wisdom teachers can teach through anything and use any means to indicate the nature of reality and the expression of the Buddha's compassion can be found in any phenomena. The Buddha cannot be construed as someone external. The compassionate benefit of Buddhas require the aspiration of the students. As we have from the Vajracharika, those who see my body, this is the Buddha speaking, those who see my body as ordinary form and hear my voice as ordinary sound have set out upon a mistaken path. Such people do not truly see me. So, authentic teaching cannot be known by the dualistic objectifying mind, as we discussed before, because the goal <coughs> of the teaching is enlightenment, and that is beyond ordinary dualistic mind. Through the path, we expand, increase our subjective pure phenomena until it is emptiness beyond duality. So here, in such an emptiness, in that nature of wisdom beyond duality, the teacher is not objectified. And hence the quote from the Vajracharika. So the benefit of the Buddhas, that for the Buddhas to be able to benefit, is entirely dependent on the student. The Buddha's compassion is naturally there, but the openness and the devotion of the student is required for there to be any connection and benefit. Ordinary love eventually leads to dissatisfaction and unhappiness. The compassionate giving love of sublime beings never causes regret. So unconditional love comes from this quality we discussed before in terms of faith. Disconnected from faith, love is reactive and contingent on the other or others. Ordinary nihilist love, ordinary love which just assesses you could say the um, gross level of just superficial appearances has expectations and is not about giving. It's about receiving or about duality. 
So even when others respond to us favorably, it only provides temporary fulfillment. We might not please others. Everything in this condition cycle of samsara can change. And we might actually even frustrate others when we are actually attempting to please them. Ordinary love, in its dualistic self-serving nature, eventually leads to dissatisfaction and unhappiness. The love of sublime beings is always by definition, by nature, without expectation, and hence never causes regret. It connects to what is real. We might not value it due to obscurations, but with faith we can increase the nature of such love the source of that, which is our own innate abiding wisdom. So again, apologies, I'm going a little bit over time, but I think at this point everybody's probably expecting that. Sometimes sublime beings with great realization act outrageously, yet their actions are genuine compassion. So enlightened beings might manifest outrageously, defying social customs. This is not frivolous or selfish outrageousness, but it's based on true and deep care for others. They're not caught by the, narrative, by the narrowness of egotism. Their actions have great value and are quintessentially compassionate. This is vastly different from callous people who might just act outrageously but do so with no regard for others. Sublime beings are careless about themselves but deeply caring for others and naturally benefit others. So when we have mm, great yogis and so on that apparently act uh, outrageously and in a wild, unconventional way, it's not because they're uninhibited in a self-serving way, but because they're free. And implicitly, such actions have tremendous benefit for others. With wisdom, we attract and benefit others. Benefiting others is an offering to the Buddhas. So through faith in the wisdom of sublime beings, spiritual qualities blossom and we attract others like bees drawn to the scent of a flower. Growing from the mud of confusion, the lotus of wisdom naturally exudes qualities that benefit others. This is also an offering to sublime beings. As it said, there is no method to make Buddhas happy other than to satisfy all beings. And, quoting Rinzen Jigme Lingba, whatever brings benefit to sentient beings brings benefit to the victorious ones, meaning the Buddhas. So therefore, as Buddha said, I myself and all sentient beings share the same suffering and happiness. And, quote, through the quality of the true nature of sublime beings, may you protect beings from suffering. So, faith in the sublime Buddha is the, is the cause of pure love without attachment. In the Vajrayana, deity is the source of unending compassion. So when we cultivate faith in the sublime Buddha and practice the Buddha's teachings, this expands pure and continuous love until it's beyond attachment. This enables our natural warmth and objectless compassion to uh, increase. This is inseparable from wisdom. And such wisdom also arising from faith discerns what is and what is not actual love. Discerning wisdom manifests from great kindness and is the cause for benefiting many beings. In the Vajrayana, practitioners assume the love of the deity meaning they mingle um, with the love of the deity, which is unconditional. And this transforms all the perceptions into loving deity phenomena. Through then, This is then effectively achieved through the practice of sadhana, through the practice of visualization, and a determined mind that uh, upholds the samaya of that particular sadhana. Such practitioners of sadhana have no expectations and ordinary nihilist love has here been expanded into unending compassion. So the ordinary love that we presently know through the practice of sadhana can be expanded 
into this quality of unending wisdom and compassion. So, Trillian Oberimager says, This great love comes from the faith which connects us to the blessings of sublime beings with the mind, so that everything, including love and faith, becomes deep and pure. Then, ultimately, without any expectation, conditions, or intention, love becomes the unobstructed emanation of the limitless, aimless, natural love of the great compassion of enlightenment. So here the chapter ends, and there are a few questions. Yeah, somebody asked. Um, yeah. I think we covered the thing about the perceptions. Yeah. Yeah. Then there's, if there is no possibility of discussing practice with a teacher, is the advice then to remain secret about one's practice? Well, it's more that one should discuss any practice with a teacher. One should clarify. One should know what to do. Um, so it's not as if that is an alternative to talking about practice with others. It's just, you could say, um, speaking with others about practice when it's just a discussion as if one was discussing ordinary phenomena um, with an ordinary dualistic person that thinks in terms of duality and objectifying phenomena, basically. Um, that's something that's that's advised against. But in general, you could say the whole practice of the Vajrayana is obviously premised on a relationship uh, to someone who, who empowers one to pursue that practice. So, then there's a question. Um, and then someone says, would you please list some accepted methods of purification of Samaya breakage? Samaya breakage is something that's very often uh, a worry for um, Western practitioners um, and for practitioners in general obviously but um, but it's we should be careful not to be um, too fearful about um, Samaya breakage um, in general for it really to be a big deal we have to be big deal um, Madriana practitioners so for us who are um, beginning the path in general, I think just that we have a, a sense of empowerment with what we're doing and aim at doing virtue, abandoning evil and mastering our mind, that's pretty good. But then again, if we are practitioners of Vajrayana, then there's the practice of Vajrasattva with what we call the four uh, strengths. And I think we might discuss that later on. But anyway, the four strengths are then that we, we um, expose our shortcomings to someone, the guru or the deity. We don't have to have anybody there. We can do it on our own. But there's a sense of invoking the guru or the Buddhas or the deity. So that's the support of the... Um, strength of the support and then we have the strength of regret that we truly wish not to do it anymore then we have uh, the vow that we that we determine to not do it anymore and then finally we actually don't do it in our in our practice we simply don't do it anymore and especially remember Indra Kandra and she at one point said well all these kind of purifications they're actually pretty useless unless one stops doing whatever it is one is doing so there's a very pragmatic quality to this, but um, yes, in general, the um, being aware of cause and effect, and then practice of um, such as Vajrasattva. Okay, no other questions. Okay, I guess we'll stop here. Then we'll dedicate the merit. So by the way, next time, yes, read the the next chapter, Seven Branch Prayer of the Accumulation of Merit. 
By this merit, may all attain omniscience, may it defeat the enemy wrongdoing. From the stormy waves of birth, old age, sickness and death, from the ocean of samsara, may all beings be freed. May bodhicitta, precious and sublime, arise where it has not yet come to be, and where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and increase ever more and more. Thank you.